In this video, we're going to discuss solution chemistry. Generally, when we have reactions, we don't tend to put solids and solids together. If you had a block of one solid and a block of another, there's atoms all lined up in it. Well, the only place that the two materials could interact is right at the point of contact. So only those particular compounds could react with one another, and then they're kind of sitting in the way, blocking the rest. Solids do not generally interact well with other solids. You can put two fairly reactive materials together as solids, and they will sit there for a very long time. So how do you get them to react? How do I take sodium chloride solids and get it to react rapidly with something else? Well, this is what aqueous solutions do. So AQ, a little subscript after a compound, tells us that this is aqueous, dissolved in water. If water comes up, that's hydrogens, well there's a fairly partially negative oxygen and there's some partially positive hydrogens. That oxygen can be attracted to the positive cation. That result is Occasionally, they can hit hard enough to break a cation free, and then it gets surrounded by waters. Instead of sticking back on, it has all these interactions with the water. Not just around it, but in front of it and behind it from all sides. The sum total of all of those interactions with the slightly negative oxygen is greater than the sum total of all of the chlorides that had been around it. As a result, it just stays surrounded by water. It drifts away in solution. Well, this can happen to the chloride too. I get a minus out here. Well, the hydrogen side is somewhat positive, and so you can surround your anions and have the waters be attracted to them as well. The net result is it will float away, and because it's surrounded in waters, if they bump into each other, well, the ions never really bump into each other. What you've done is you've pulled your ions apart. Instead of a tight, dense solid, each of those ions now drifts away. And you start separating bit by bit each individual ion as they get surrounded by water. And now you have them as open as possible. Instead of having a solid with a bunch of trapped inside material that's protected from interacting with another solid, you have completely separated them into independent ions. This is why we like things to be aqueous. It makes the reactions easy. They can actually access and all of the different atoms can interact with each other. Well, I have sodium chloride aqueous. I have silver nitrate aqueous. But I have silver chloride solid and sodium nitrate aqueous. If you take sodium chloride solid and you dissolve it in water, it becomes a clear liquid. It's a solution. The ions are spread within that water. The silver nitrate, same deal. You take the solid, put it in some water, mix it up, it'll dissolve and spread out, and you have a solution of silver nitrate. Pour those two containers together and you will get a clear solution that has sodium nitrate dissolved in it, but a powder at the bottom composed of silver chloride. So the silver and the chloride won't dissolve. It ends up that that pair is actually stronger at holding together than the water is at surrounding either of them. And so not everything will dissolve in water. This is why rocks are in the rivers and sand at the ocean. Plenty of things don't dissolve. Well, what does dissolve? For that, we have some solubility rules. What is soluble? What things do we expect to dissolve? And so here's our solubility in water. First and foremost, we expect all lithium, sodium, potassiums. We call these the group 1As. They're the left column. It's the old name for 1A was the leftmost column. And the ammoniums. These ions dissolve really well, so much so that anything that they're attached to also is forced to dissolve. If the sodium goes away, well, you can't have all the sodiums leave and leave behind whatever anion. The anions have to dissolve as well. 
And so they are really good at dragging anything else into solution. Additionally, then we have some anions that we assume will always dissolve. Are all nitrates and all acetate. And so this is not one of our standard ones, but acetate is the anion of vinegar. So vinegar loses H+, what's remaining is acetate. And so it's fairly good at dissolving everything in two, and so we don't expect there to be any exceptions. Now, granted, there's a lot of different compounds in the universe, there's probably always a rare exception somewhere, but there's no general exceptions. And this table is really about the most common ions and their general exceptions. Third row down, all chloride, bromide, and iodide are assumed to be soluble, with a few exceptions, as we saw up above. Silver. Silver iodide, silver bromide, and silver chloride are insoluble. They pair so strongly that water can't really pull them apart. This is true also for lead, too. And for a polyatomic cation that doesn't see much use in the world anymore, dimercurium. And so two Hg plus ions can combine and form one dimercury cation. We don't like working with mercury anymore, so this is not a particularly common one. But mercury is a weird element, and so we used to use a lot of it. Last row, all sulfate. Sulfates are remarkably soluble in general. They're also not reactive. They tend to dissolve, and that's it. And so we love to use sulfates where we can because they don't interfere in our other chemistry and they tend to dissolve stuff really well. Few exceptions, the second column, the lower part of it, barium, strontium, calcium, as well as lead and silver. These all tend to make solids with sulfate. Well, if you can have things that are soluble by default, that leads to the idea that there are insoluble things by default, stuff that will not go into water. And so we have a little list of that as well. First and foremost, all hydroxides, your iron hydroxides, your magnesium and calcium hydroxides, these are things we don't expect to dissolve. If you've ever seen runoff streams from a mine, it's red and brown and orange. That's actually our iron hydroxides plating out and coloring this ground underneath because they don't dissolve readily. Exceptions here, the 1As, so lithium, sodium, potassium, and ammonium. Well, this is why we use sodium hydroxide and potassium hydroxide and ammonium hydroxide so often. They're kind of the only ways to get hydroxide in the solution. All sulfides, S2 minuses. They have a limited set of exceptions, but sulfides are some of the most insoluble materials you can make. In fact, it's how we used to remove metals from solution. We would bubble H2S gas through. The sulfide would pair up with metals, turn solid, crash out, and leave some acid behind. Not the cleanest chemistry in modern standards, but it was a good way to remove all the metals from solution. In fact, the most insoluble. Mercury 2 sulfide. This compound, to get one mole of it to dissolve, you would need a ball of water the weight of the planet Earth. To, if you have some of this in a container with one liter of water, and you shake and you shake and you shake to try to get it to dissolve, at any given moment, you have a 50-50 chance that a single atom of it has dissolved. It is incredibly insoluble. So much so that it's actually how we originally found mercury. Mercury sulfide is this beautiful rock. It's gorgeous red cinnabar. In fact, you can buy some beautiful jewelry and jewelry boxes and like. It's this intense red stone. Well, if you were to use that red stone in a campfire, the fire could burn the sulfur. The sulfur leaves is SO2. It's stinky a little bit, but it leaves mercury behind. And so humans actually had mercury long before we had almost any other metal because all you had to do was accidentally burn one of these stones and then your fire pit would have this silvery liquid at the bottom the next day. And so we've had mercury for a long time, we just didn't have much use for it. And finally, all carbonates and all phosphates. 
with the 1A and ammonium exceptions. So our calcium phosphates help make up our bones. It's good that they don't dissolve. And calcium carbonates are seashells. I mean, if the seashells dissolved, that wouldn't work in the ocean. So the fact that carbonates are largely resilient to solution is very useful for a lot of life on Earth. What affects solubility then? Because while we have these graphs of what we expect to be soluble and insoluble, we have to recognize what that term represents. If something is soluble, that means a reasonable amount on the human scale dissolves in it. If something is insoluble, that means so little it's not reasonable on the human scale. But the truth is, you can get a tiny amount of anything to dissolve. Those ions can just get bumped into water by water so hard a few of them break free, and until they come back and stick to the solid, they're technically dissolved. There's always a tiny amount of anything that can dissolve. Generally though, if it's not a statistically significant amount, we call it insoluble. So it can adjust it. Generally we can make a solid solubility go up if temp goes up. This is a general rule. There's a couple rare exceptions to this. But for the most part, if you heat something up, more stuff dissolves. If you've ever made Kool-Aid or something, heating up the water a little bit helps the sugar dissolve, and then you can cool it back down. In theory, you could have got it all to dissolve anyways, but it just does it faster, and it honestly can hold more if you get it hotter. Same with salt and other things. If it is hotter, more will dissolve. This is true for solids, but if you have gases, gas solubility goes down if temperature goes up. So think about this for a sec. A solid, well, what makes it break apart? Things hitting it. Water has to bounce into it. If you move faster because your temp is higher, you can hit harder, you can break it apart. It's harder for solids to come back together. A gas, on the other hand, well, you have a liquid. The gases, by their nature, want to be individual free-floating molecules. They don't want to be near each other. They have so much energy and so little forces holding them together, they just want to spread out. So if you suddenly put them in solution, the whole lot of things around them, this is not the environment they're well-suited for. They're not attracted to those molecules very much. They have so much energy, they want to escape. The only reason gas is in liquid at all is if it hits hard enough, it can burrow in, and then it bounces around until eventually it pff, escapes and goes back into the air. The colder you are, the slower you're bouncing around. And what little attractive forces there is to the water can hold on a little bit better. The hotter you are, the faster you're bouncing, the easier it is to escape. And so gas solubility goes down as temperature goes up because it already wants to be out of solution. But solid solubility goes up with temperature increase because it means there's more energy to break the solid apart and spread it out into the water. So this is a quick look at the idea of solutions. What are solutions? How do we make them? What can be in them? And the symbols we use to kind of indicate them. How do we know if it's a solid a gas, or if it's dissolved, we put S for solid, G for gas, if you have a liquid L, but aqueous is a dissolved in water. We don't have liquid salt, and we don't have liquid sodium nitrate. We have a solution of those solids dissolved in water. We'll continue with aqueous solutions and the math for it in our next video.